Guys, I'm very concerned. This corn is supposed to be knee high by the 4th of July, and it's July 3rd. So this stuff is gonna have to go significantly backward to meet that target. I don't know how I'm gonna get it to do that, but this is tough. I don't know what to do. Meanwhile, down below, you can see the interseeded cover crops. They are fighting a real hard fight with a bunch of ragweed down here. And uh, actually a bunch of water hemp too. But uh, as I think I might have said in a prior segment, um, I'm not really concerned about the weed pressure. The corn's canopied, this is shaded. It's gonna do whatever it's gonna do at this point. There's no more herbicides or anything that I would want to put on this because we want the cover crop to come through and uh, we can't have it both ways. We have to allow the weeds to grow if we want the cover crop to grow and do all the beneficial things that it does in here interseeded. Not every part of the field looks like this. Um, this is not, this is probably representative of about the middle ground. There are parts of the field that are perfectly clean and you can see the four cover crop rows with that uh, seed mix in there growing really nicely and it looks like the most perfect field you can imagine. And then there are spots where there's twice as much ragweed as this. It actually, it seems like it's right where I combined, where the uh, combine blew out all the ragweed seeds. So every three or so corn rows, all of a sudden there'll be a really heavy stand of ragweed. And I think that's where the rear of the combine was during soybean harvest last year. And it just blew the seeds in a nice swath to come up now this year. Uh, I think that any weed fighting benefit we're gonna get from this is gonna come next year. But as for this year, I mean, part of the, part of the scenario where ragweed and other uh, larger annual broadleaf weeds come up is if you have compaction in the soil and if you have a nitrogen surplus. And um, I kind of like the idea that we're sucking up any nitrogen surplus with the annual ryegrass and obviously the corn is using everything it can get its hands on uh, right around now, from now until it uh, fills out its ears. Uh, but annual ryegrass has got a really deep root uh, system. And uh, last year it didn't work as well because we were so wet. It rained so frequently that the roots never really went deep into the soil. They weren't going down to seek out moisture because they had plenty in the top two inches all the time. This year I'm really hoping that the annual ryegrass, I seeded it at an extra heavy rate. And uh, between that and the tillage radishes, I'm really hoping it'll it'll drive its roots down and, and break some of that compaction up and then the environment will not be as hospitable to ragweed and other and water hemp and other annual uh, broadleaf weeds. So we just have to take it with the long view in mind and not the short view. The other interesting thing that I've observed here is that a lot of this ragweed has got holes in the leaves. There's something in here, an insect in here, that is just kicking the crap out of the ragweed but not affecting the corn. It looks like it's also affecting maybe the uh, the radishes and the kale, the kind of brassica looking stuff that's growing in here, but not too much. Um, oh, I do see some crimson clover too. The crimson clover is always a little bit behind the annual ryegrass and the, and the, and the uh, radishes and the kale. So uh, it's nice to see that in here too. So some of those bigger leafed brassicas are getting a little bit of, of bug pressure on them too but it's just a cover crop, so it doesn't matter. I, I do like the fact though that something is attacking this ragweed. Probably it's not gonna be enough to damage it in a way that it really, uh, you know, puts too much pressure on it. But it's kind of nice to know that maybe some of the natural world is on our side here. <laughs> we left some room for something, for some species to come in and help us out. And uh, you know, that's the best kind of teamwork right there, so. I'm gonna try to figure out what it is, what specific bug is uh, is damaging this ragweed. It looks like it's some it's some little black aphid looking things now that I just caught sight of a couple right next to me. But I'm not sure, I'll have to try to identify it and see what it is. I happened upon a spot here down under the corn canopy where there's a really nice row of uh, cover crops in here. This is one of the better rows uh, or spots that I've seen so far in the field out in the middle. So th that's really nice. That's kind of representative of what we would like it to always look like. <laughs> So, just for comparison. So, again, <laughs> I keep thinking of things I want to add to this video as I go along. Uh, now I'm in the cornfield by County Road 8, <laughs> which I was in the other day and talking about weed pressure. And it's real interesting because uh, to walk through a whole cornfield when it gets this tall, you have a hard time seeing what's going on. So you almost have to walk down a row and then turn and go over 
10 feet and then walk it again because it could be totally different 10 feet over or 12 feet over or 20 feet over or 50 feet over. So when I was in here the other day, I was real concerned about the weed pressure. The road is over there, over the hill. And of course, of course, next to the road, that's where the weeds are the worst. We've got, we've got a big bunch of ragweed and uh, water hemp and different stuff in there that's uh, really visible from the road and looks bad. Um, and uh, I, I, I kind of touched on that in one of my last videos. But now I'm in the middle of the field and um, it's super clean. I'm gonna take you down here uh, in between the rows and show you. So this is really lovely. I mean, we've got cover crops coming up in here looking really healthy, no weeds. And I mean, this is just row after row in the middle of the field. So it's really remarkable how in one place you can have a patch of ragweed that's so thick you almost can't see through it. And then you move over a little ways and all of a sudden it's really, really clean. So uh, I just wanted to show you that for contrast. This looks really good. Here's another one, really nice. I don't know uh, if this looks exactly the same as the last shot, but just an example, this is what we wanna see, that, that cover crop getting a nice establishment under the canopy. And the corn is a little shorter in this field. Um, so n unlike the one I was in, the big 18 acre field, that, that field is particularly fertile. And this corn's, oh, four inches shorter than it, despite the fact that it was planted a day earlier. Um, still gonna be fine, still looking great. Uh, the soil composition is just much different in this field. So that's the kind of, this is the kind of cover crop, interseeded cover crop that we want to see in a corn crop. Uh, and this is the level of weed pressure we'd like to see. So I guess we're achieving goals in some spots, but you know, if we walk a hundred yards that way, we might see something totally different. This is our driveway field of soybeans. And this was the one field out of our three soybean fields. This was the one that was planted green into standing cereal rye. And in prior videos, I showed that as the cereal rye was way tall and the beans were just teeny little guys and talked about how we were going to terminate that. And then I showed it at termination as well and how that rye was kind of all standing dead in there with the beans coming up. And so now at this point, July 3rd, the rye has pretty much tipped over except for a couple little strips you can see where uh, the, the co-op sprayer missed and then dad went out and hand sprayed it. So that's a little further behind, but... Um, in the main field, that rye has all now pretty much tipped over. There's a few stems sticking up. Um, this is our best looking bean field. I'm quite proud of this actually. And to me, it's a, a reassurance that this is a good system to do. Planting green into cereal rye with soybeans. Wonderful. It suppressed the weeds um, uh, and kept the, the soil conditions really nice for those beans to grow in. They coexist together really well. They really seem to like each other. If that's possible among plants, they kind of feed off of one another, I think. Um, the cereal rye encourages the beans to nodulate by taking up the excess nitrogen in the soil. And the beans, I think, feed a little bit of something back to the, to the cereal rye while the rye is still growing. Assuming the beans have nodulated, they would be fixing and per perhaps providing some nitrogen back to the rye. And it all looked really good. And then after we terminated the rye and it died off, between terminating the rye and whatever weed suppression the rye had, plus the, um, the regular herbicide application, there's hardly a weed in this field. It's just really beautiful. The beans are dark green. They're about shin high on me. Uh, a few of them are starting to flower a little bit. There's very little pest pressure in there. There's a few holes in some leaves. I think we've got a few leaf hoppers in there, but it's nothing really at this point that I'm concerned about. We don't typically do any pesticide applications on our beans because uh, we've never had enough pressure to really demand it. Um, so fingers crossed this will continue to be the trend. Just a really nice field of beans, very consistent. This was planted at a little bit higher population. In fact, probably quite a bit higher population. We were shooting for 145,000 plants per acre. Then assuming, uh, you know, 90% germination rate, we'd be down a little bit from that point. We had the drill miscalibrated on this field, and I think we were closer to maybe 160 or 170,000 bush, uh, sorry, 160 or 170,000 plants per acre. That's what I was trying to say. Um, not really sure on that though, because we're not sure how much over we were. Uh, it just, and, and actually dad and I have talked about that since then, that we may, 
look at planting our beans at a heavier population, maybe shooting for that 160, 170,000 plants per acre because of the no-till drill and the fact that some of those seeds may not get placed perfectly. Um, anyway, it just really looks good. So I wanted to show you this field. I wish our other two bean fields looked this good. They do look good. They're very clean, but the beans are definitely not as advanced as these are. These are doing quite a bit better in terms of their progress. Um, the other ones are pretty short yet. However, we can talk about soil composition a little bit too. This field is a much lighter soil type than the other two fields. The other, the other two bean fields are heavy clay in most areas. And, um, you know, if I scouted them a little more carefully, I might find that in some of the low areas, the beans are doing better than on those clay hills. I've mostly walked on the clay hills, so that's the impression that I've gotten. Uh, so due diligence on my part, I should probably go out and, and get a little bit better idea of the consistency out there. But on those two fields, the beans are not nearly as tall. They seem a little bit further behind. Um, so this field has really leapt ahead of them. I think having that cereal rye cover in ahead of beans is just... I was told, I was told it's a no-brainer. Planting green into cereal rye with soybeans was a no-brainer. And now that I've done it, uh, and done it pretty thoroughly on this field, I would really agree with that. It's a really great system. So I ended up out on a little bit of a field walk this evening. I will say that is one thing about regenerative agriculture practices, the no-till cover crops practices we're using on the farm now. I do a lot more field walks. <laughs> I'm out here at least once a week. I try to get through every field and give a look at what's going on and make some notes about what I'm seeing. Um, actually, what I need to start doing is bringing a shovel with me and start digging into the soil too, because uh, I, I have a feeling I'd be kind of interested in some of the things I might find. Um, the soil transformation process is a slow one, though, so maybe not. I guess the only way to find out is if I would start bringing a shovel with me. So that's on my goals list going forward. I ended up in our other soybean fields. Um, just wanted to give a contrast compared to that one by the driveway. These look pretty good, too, honestly. Uh, they are not as tall, though. I have noticed no-till beans have a reputation for being shorter than their tillage counterparts. And I have found that to be true in the two years that I've been doing them. With the exception being those ones by the driveway that were planted green into the cereal rye. They got some extra height because they were competing for sunlight uh, with the uh, rye in their early stages, which is exactly what I was hoping they would do. Um, I kind of predicted that, and I'm happy to say it came true. These other fields that were not planted green, and they didn't have a lot of grasses. They just had some annual rye grass, but it was real patchy, and uh, there wasn't really much of a motivator for them to put on extra height. So uh, these are short. We got a few flowers starting. They really need to pack on some height before fall, but it's July 3rd, so I'm not worried about it really. As long as they keep doing what they're doing, we're gonna be just fine. Um, but yeah, that's a nice clean field of beans. Our beans in general look really good this year, and the corn looks really good uh, clearly from the height that it's put on. But that bigger 18-acre field is the healthier of the two fields. The one behind me here is our uh, smaller 8-acre uh, field by County Road 8. And um, that one is not quite as nice on the clay hill. The corn is not quite as tall and not quite as vigorous. Um, and it's got a certain amount of weed pressure in it that's a little heavier than typical. Um, but uh, I guess really, you know, we can talk about it and talk about it. But the real proof now at this point is going to be at the end of the season. We just watch it go, and uh, whatever it yields is what matters. Um, whatever it produces for us relative to what we put into it. Um, these beans, by the way, getting back to the soybeans, are not fertilized. Uh, last year we put phosphorus on the beans, uh, which is what is usually called for when growing beans. It's the nutrient that they rely heaviest on versus the corn, which relies on a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, we decided to go low input on the beans and just plant them without any fertilizer, which we have done in the past, and see what happens. And um, so far it's looking good. I don't really regret that at this point. We'll see how they mature. Again, talking about it a lot in the middle of the season is, is really uh, not to be advised usually because, <laughs> you, may, you know, you look and you make assumptions and you see things that maybe you shouldn't be paying that much attention to and you miss things that maybe you should be paying attention to. And in the end, you, know, you don't really know that until the yield comes in and you actually harvest and see how it goes. So we're just, we're just out here speculating. 
<laughs> and observing. But so far the beans look good without any fertilizer on them. And um, for us that's good because that's a cost effective crop then. We, we put that in for the cost of the seed and the spray. And um, uh, if the market price is fair in the fall when we combine and sell, because remember, we don't have storage for these. So when we harvest these, they go straight to market. So whatever the price is for beans in the fall, that's what we get. And uh, keeping your inputs low is just a nice way to hedge uh, uh, towards making a profit uh, when it's harvest time. So I'm hopeful. It looks good. Well, last but not least, if we're doing a true field walk, this is the last field we can look at, which is our teff grass field. I mean, I suppose we could look at the alfalfa field too, but that's just the same all the time. So... <laughs> This is our teff grass field, though. We were very concerned about this getting established. Um, and it had a lot of broadleaf weed in it. Uh, so Dad did spray it for broadleaf with a 2,4-D. Um, I see a patchy mist, but uh, we got most of it, it looks like. And uh, it was very, very patchy. Teff is kind of hard to get established, I've since discovered. Um, when, when we had trouble getting it to come up and germinate, uh, then I went looking online at some different forums where people talk about it and having a really firm seed bed seems to be the key. Uh, if we'd have been able to run like a cultipacker over the ground before we ran the brilliant seeder and then maybe cultipack it again is sort of what people say is the, a really good way to get it established. It likes very firm compacted soil. Um, we didn't really have that option so it was a test run but what you're seeing behind me and around me it's filling in now. There's still some spots that are kind of bare, pretty sparse. Um, but you know, for the cost, this is a couple hundred dollars in seed to do this. And then there's a little two acre patch of it as well. The mosquitoes are chewing me alive. You guys should know that as I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> I'm trying very hard to ignore them. There's a little two acre patch that we seeded with Teff as well. That was included in that seed cost. And that's doing really well. We're going to get some nice cuttings of hay off of that. And I'd say we're only 15 days, maybe 20 days away from having our first cutting on here. So um, the stuff is coming up nicely now in a lot of places. So let me flip the camera around. We'll give a look at that. And uh, then we'll be done here for the day for, with this lesson. Here we go. I know the light is not great. It's getting close to dark out here. That's why I'm getting mauled by bugs. But you can see, you can see some of the broadleaf there curling up yet from the spray. Um, the field looks generally okay. This this looks pretty pretty thin in this area. If I turn around right here, like this is an example of a pretty bald, bad spot. There's about three spots like this in the field where, and that really does not reflect the 12 pounds or so of seed that we put on. We actually overseeded a bit heavy, uh, heavier than what we intended to. We were looking to get 10 pounds per acre. We figured we ended up about 12 pounds per acre. The drill was set a bit heavy. And yet, you know, we still didn't get much establishment in places like this. And that's kind of on those dry clay hills. I don't even know if I'd call this clay. This is like a gravel right in here. So it didn't take very well there. But down in the low area, there's a lot of organic matter down there. That's very dark soil down in that corner. And it, it just took off like a shot there. So if you've got high organic matter soil, teff is pretty easy to establish. But in some of these, uh, some of these uh, little more barren spots here are not quite as good a soil quality uh but it's coming along it i think it's gonna pick up and get enough biomass and growth here that we can make some decent hay off of it so that's it for today july 3rd we are in what you might call the lazy hazy days of summer um except we're not feeling very lazy there's always something to do but <laughs> this is kind of that time when we watch things grow and monitor and take notes and try to plan and uh, anticipate what our next move is for all of this stuff so Thanks for uh, coming along with me, and uh, we'll catch you next time.